a good story is just that. A story, but a great one. Western media and really Western culture thrives on the rule of three. We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The news broadcasts morning, noon, and night. And one of our most revered formats of media is the trilogy. Everything rides on that third installment, a satisfying ending that follows everything the beginning and middle were leading up to. You must convince your audience that the two preceding pieces were worth it in the end. A bad third installment can frame the entire series in a negative light. A good third installment will induct the entire series into the halls of fame. Some of the most famous pieces of media in history are trilogies, and some of the most infamous were a fine idea, a decent sequel, and a bad finale. You simply cannot spare to screw up your third installment. Nothing can stand in your way if you want to leave your audience fulfilled and satisfied. Halos 1 and 2 were rushed. There is no getting around that. Crunch can only push a team to do so much, and the end result was a compromised game two times over. Halo 1 had to reuse entire maps, recontextualizing them with new enemies to make the rest of the game feel unique. Halo 2 had its entire third act cut, which was set to include Master Chief teaming up with the Arbiter, a Covenant exile sent to his own death, to find the Ark on Earth and use it to shut down the Halo array. An entire massive multiplayer mode that supported likely two dozen players at the same time on maps the size of entire campaign levels was axed in favor of at most 16 in cramped arenas. Neither game was perfect, or complete for that matter, but Microsoft had run Bungie through the ringer for Halo, for a sign that the Xbox belonged on the market alongside long runner Nintendo and the previous generation's best seller, the Sony PlayStation. All that was going to come to a head, with a new generation of hardware and a game built from the ground up to prove that the Xbox 360 was going to win the console wars once and for all. This is a story of a game as big as the internet, once upon a time, of a world that captivated ours, one of the biggest pop cultural phenomenons of its age. It's time, let's talk about Halo 3, the finale of the Halo trilogy. Halo 3 opens with the Master Chief just crash landing, just on his own, just into the dirt. We're in East Africa now, chasing after the High Prophet of Truth, the last vestige of the Covenant's death cult. Gameplay-wise, yep, that's Halo. Visually, the game looks fantastic, and this time they aren't just using a janky PC port. Probably because this is the first PC port Halo 3 has ever gotten, so there wasn't a weird Gearbox one to rip off. But that's kind of beside the point. If you played Halo 1 or 2, you've played Halo 3. New to the series is the addition of two new grenades, the Spike Grenade and the Firebomb. As well as the addition of auxiliary equipment which can take the form of all kinds of gizmos, from temporary cover to shield generators to trip mines, and I never really intentionally used any of this stuff. Again, if you played Halo 1 or 2, you played 3, and I didn't need any of that stuff then. I would just slap an enemy with my gun, dump some lead in them, and then wait to slap them again. If I needed to heal, I would just hide, and if I die, i just do that again but take note of what killed me. It's not optimal, but it works for the regular difficulty, and that's one of the cool things about building upon a legacy like this. Older fans recognize the gestalts that got them hooked in the first place and can stick to what they know, or experiment with the new and sometimes the game can throw them a curveball to get them to try things the past games wouldn't let you do. In what I thought was relatively early into the game, but turned out to be like the halfway point, Truth activates a portal to a far-off realm at the same time that the Flood arrive on Earth. And we get a segment where we team up with the alien brutes and the like to fight back the Flood, which... Can I just say... It's really good. Cortana has been stranded in high charity since the end of Halo 2, and it's become a swarming, bloated hive of the Flood, with the Gravemind having taken complete control of the facility. Truth's last-ditch effort involves arriving at the Ark, which can detonate every Halo in the universe and wipe out all life. At the same time, high charity crash lands into the Ark, bringing with it the Gravemind and the Flood. As the enemy of thy enemy is thy friend, the Gravemind offers to help kill Truth with Chief and the Arbiter, though quickly backstabs them in what is actually surprisingly the game's climax with Miranda Keys unceremoniously killed. If you asked me where I was in the game, I'd probably say the halfway point. 
No, Halo 3 is not a long game. It's about 6 hours in length with minimal hiccups. Compare it to Halo 2, which took about 9 hours under the same circumstances. But contrast that Halo 3 was born from the climax of Halo 2, and suddenly I have no idea what's going on anymore. Should this game be longer? Should this game be shorter? I don't know. We do get to explore the dilapidated remains of High Charity in a very gruesome level, with Cortana having been compromised by the Gravemind, babbling nonsense and- Would you stop taking control from me every few seconds? This, this game has been doing this thing constantly, where it slows to a crawl to play a message from Cortana or the Gravemind, and here it just, keep, it just keeps doing it. just keeps doing it. I want to play the game. I don't want to get a lecture. As we leave, we're treated to a new Halo arriving from out of the Ark. Yeah, this is where they build them, and this one is far from complete. Actually, this one is the one we destroyed in Halo 1. I would know I totally, definitely, absolutely played all of Halo 1. Um, detonating it wouldn't destroy the whole universe, just itself, really, and probably the Ark. It doesn't have the range to reach other Halos being outside the galaxy the way it is. The Grave Mind, in its last-ditch effort, starts carpet bombing the new Halo with drop pods to try and take that one over. But if we destroy this and destroy the Ark, which holds the Grave Mind and High Charity, then this should be the last we see of the Flood. Right? Uh-oh, 343, the, this orb, which is inspired by this orb and went on to inspire this orb, opts to kill off Johnson, who was our really our second in command through and through, as it must protect the Halo and it will not let it be activated prematurely. One orb death and one Johnson death later, all we have left is the Arbiter, Cortana, Ron Perlman, and the Chief. But I guess at the, it's the end of the trilogy. Might as well go out with a bang? And a bang indeed as we race across the surface of the Halo and back to forward onto Dawn. And here we're just treated to raw and undistilled spectacle. The Halo theme in its entirety amped up to extremes, surrounded by explosions and scripted physics destructions. The whole gambit of violence and decimation as we race through crowds of flood towards our destination. I... I get it. We'll come back to what I get later, um, but for now we crash the jeep into the ship and... Uh-oh, uh John. The front half of the old Covenant ship arrives back on Earth with the Arbiter in tow. The Covenant War is over and the UNSC and the Arbiter and his crew part ways. Mourning the loss of Keys, of Johnson, the countless lives the Covenant War took, but most vitally, the Master Chief. The back half of Forward Unto Dawn survived the tear, but it's so far from the solar system it might be years before they can be rescued. The Chief begins to put himself into cryogenic stasis. Wake me when you need me. He says, and the game draws to a close. It's impactful. Yeah, but I need to unpack a lot of personal sentiments about the game. Halo 3 continues with the interplay between the Covenant, the Flood, and the UNSC in lots of fun ways. Teaming up with the Brutes to fight the Flood, teaming up with the Flood to fight the Covenant. Having the Arbiter be your player 2 the whole way through in co-op, or just a really solid AI companion otherwise. But compared to Halo 2, where the two had intertwined storylines but were mostly separate, and you played as both, how the Arbiter starts with needlers and energy swords, but finds himself using pump shotguns and carbines as he battles the Flood, and his own arsenal depletes, how the Chief starts with an assault rifle and a pistol, but he picks up energy swords and brute shots as he slaughters the Covenant, how the Arbiter gets the final mission and it's teaming up with Johnson, Halo 3's use of the interplay between the factions feels like a step forward, but also one back. The environments are rather impactful, with large and expansive skyboxes to really give the new hardware a kick to the pants past games couldn't have even dreamed of achieving. But they're often buried beneath cluttered buildings or challenging objectives, so you don't get to stop and appreciate them all that well. Some details like screen space reflections and normal maps help give the game more texture, but they're sparingly used, especially the reflections, which make the environments not feel terribly advanced versus Halo 2 sometimes. Now, when 3 looks good, it really looks good. I'd say you could still ship this game today. But in many places, the three years of technical advancement and a whole new hardware generation just feel squandered. It's totally made up for with the moments that shine, but I feel like between a game that looks good in a few places and a game that looks consistently pretty decent, I'd rather take consistency. 
But how good is the game? Just where does Halo 3 rank in my infamous wrong, trademark, FPS rating scale? For a, a brief reminder on where my opinion on these things lie, S-Rank is home to the likes of Ultra Kill, Doom, Left 4 Dead. They do one thing, but they do them phenomenally. Every square inch is smartly designed, and nothing feels like over filler. It's packed with surprises, and challenges what we like about FPSs. A is home to the likes of Doom Eternal, Half-Life 1, and Halo 2. There's a couple burrs and snags, some balanced weirdness sometimes, but overall, it's a fantastic game and can easily stand the test of time if it's treated well. B is home to Titanfall 2, Borderlands 3, Quake. A game that's overall quite nice, but it has some pieces that just aren't as good as they should be. Whether it's slow and clunky gameplay and an otherwise smooth as silk experience, or bland and repetitive level design, or just being written like hot garbage and held together by a very dedicated One Piece fan, here's looking at you Borderlands 3, B is home to games that are still good, but I'd probably think twice before putting them on a top 10 list. C... C is just okay. They may have defined future FPSs, but going back to these games is dreadful and plagued with some of the worst parts of antiquated game design. They're still fun to be had, regardless of whether or not that previous part is true. But these games, whether they're old or new, all have one thing in common. They're just kind of jank. Sometimes that jank is endearing, and sometimes it isn't. This tier is home to the likes of the first Serious Sam, Raid World War II. I'm gonna get shit on for this. Boneworks. I'm sorry, your IK player controller is cool, but it also makes every single part of the game harder to play. And below that, in D and E, baby, that's uncharted territory. May we never, ever venture that deep. Halo 3 is a low A, or at the very top of B. It feels like it's missing a certain je ne sais quoi compared to the second, but I liked it more than the first. But I'm one person of soon-to-be indeterminable gender, playing it almost 15 years after its release. Millions played it at launch. And what it was about the game and why it was so popular will tell us a lot about the legacy it's left. Not just on the series, not just on the Xbox, but on gaming as a whole. Much like Halo set the bar for console FPSs and Halo 2 set the bar for online connectivity, Halo 3 set the bar for online community. The game had cosmetics to unlock, new playlists opening and closing all the time, and given that online on the Xbox involved directly wiring a modem to your console, and Wi-Fi adapters for the 360 were just more readily available, and with homes adopting Wi-Fi more and more with the likes of the Nintendo DS and the upcoming smartphone market, Halo 3 released at just the right time for the early days of console online. 2007 to 2010 were undoubtedly the peak for Halo, and honestly, they were kind of a new wild west for gaming, a new frontier. Online gaming had been possible, Doom Deathmatch was played by millions. By the time Halo 3 came out, and Sonic Adventure 1 had DLC in 1998. So it wasn't new tech, but Wi-Fi had made online gaming so instantly accessible. You plug this magic box in, call your ISP, and suddenly any device in your home could be connected to the internet. You didn't need modems everywhere. And to go from standard definition with internet that's tough to set up to the frictionless ability to game in 720p with people all around the world in just a few years? Amazing. And Halo wasn't alone in revolutionizing this space. Call of Duty was a series of war shooters that enjoyed a soft reboot in 2007 with the Modern Warfare trilogy. The series was originally about World War II, but now players navigate a story ripped from the headlines, hot off the heels of the War on Terror's stranglehold on American culture, and they can enjoy this new thing called Team Deathmatch online, and wield its wide variety of real-world guns against your friends and strangers. In 2008, you had to be either Team Halo 3 or Team Modern Warfare, or you had no friends. I was Team Elebits. While the Wii was a worldwide phenomenon and the best-selling of the three 7th generation consoles, nobody talked about what was going on over there. I mean, what did you even have to discuss? Super Mario Galaxy and Metroid Prime 3 were fine games, but they weren't online. Metroid Prime Hunters was a neat arena shooter taking inspiration from Quake, but it was on the DS, and playing FPSs on the DS isn't anyone's definition of fun. Mario Kart Wii and Super Smash Bros. Brawl wouldn't be out until 08, and even then, those were considered really kiddy. 
You had to play a mature game to prove your mettle. You were 11, not 8. Come on, say a slur into the headset mic. Halo 3 was a massive cultural touchstone. The, the whole era was, let's be honest with ourselves. And it might be because being edgy was cruise control for cool. If you self-regulated with the ESRB and felt that even heck and darn were sinful, you were only ever going to play these games at your friend's house on their giant 55-inch HDTV in the basement with the sound system cranked up to max, while he swore into the headset at random people online. You'd be enamored by this thing that was out of grasp. Games in a display bigger than you'd ever seen, in a fidelity the Wii couldn't touch, and they'd haunt you for years. Until that friend's sister tries to set you on fire at his birthday, and then you find him on Facebook a couple years later telling trans women from your old high school to kill themselves, at which point you sever any and all ties and openly express your discontent for the person they became, Matthew. Ask me how I know. <clears throat> Halo 3 isn't looked back on for its campaign. Okay. It isn't looked back on just for its campaign. It's fine, full of moments raising the bar for cinematography and motion capture and video games. But if you had Halo 2 and not 3, you weren't missing out on too much aside from a frame rate. But it was that whole second world, that giant open sandbox of things to do and people to shoot, that kept players' attentions for years. Hell, I didn't even talk about the Forge. You could take pre-existing multiplayer maps, tweak them, add and remove props, alter the game rules, and make totally new modes. There were all sorts of glitches players passed around online and in person to do certain things in the Forge. And with YouTube becoming more and more popular, broadcasting your hijinks online was a quick way to become popular in 08. While Rooster Teeth's Red vs. Blue had been around since 2002 via peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, it was YouTube's video streaming that kicked the series and its creators into mainstream success. But having a very accessible online community led to Halo 3 and the later titles sticking around for a very long time. And a lot of that has to do with that being people's first experience with online gaming, in a lot of cases. Everyone remembers their first time. For me, it was getting the orange box my 14th birthday, pleading that I was mature enough to handle it and that my god-awful compact Presario laptop could handle it, and then downloading and playing Team Fortress 2. And then it went free to play a couple weeks later. But I hold the game in rather high regard, and even through it all, can't help myself from not dismissing the title. Even as aimbots ravage the official servers and the game's monetization and UX have become more egregious. For you, it might have been Modern Warfare, or World at War, Black Ops, the Call of Duty series in general, with its more tactical modern realism, the quick deaths and satisfying, snappy gameplay. It might have been Battlefield. But for a swath of fans at the tail end of the Bush administration, nosediving into an economic recession you could argue we never truly recovered from? <laughs> they found solace with the UNSC, fighting side by side as Spartans upon Halo. But this is where our story ends. Bungie works in threes. Their previous series, Marathon, told its story in three games, and Halo had done the same. The Covenant War was over, the Gravemind destroyed, and Chief back in cryogenic stasis, where he started the trilogy. There was nowhere else to go, and stirrings of starting up a new world or series were beginning over at Bungie. But here's the thing. Bungie didn't own the rights to Halo. Microsoft did, and Microsoft wanted more games. There was nowhere to go forwards, but maybe they didn't have to go forwards. See. Bungie was working on a Halo film in 05 with the team at Weta Workshop. You might know him for the wacky steampunk shit in Team Fortress 2, or for the CGI and VFX work on the likes of Lord of the Rings or Tintin. Peter Jackson, enamored by the world and its themes of religious overthrow, wanted to direct an episodic game series set in Halo's world. Halo Chronicles was set to be a personal story about a regular marine becoming more and more alien to combat the increasing threats becoming a Promethean in its final episode. When the Halo film fell through though, so did Chronicles, and Bungie returned to the Halo team with some plans. They loved the idea of doing a Halo game not about the Master Chief, but about regular Marines who fought alongside him. And doing a game about an orbital drop shock team seemed like the perfect foil for the walking one-man army the Master Chief was. Uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about that next year.
I just want to say thank you for making 2021 as fun as it was. We covered a lot of unexpected ground, but I cannot wait to surprise, delight, and inform you all in 2022. I appreciate the likes, and I read every comment, so if you have some thoughts, leave them. And if you like the videos, share them. That really does help. So much of the channel's growth is word of mouth. And if you really like the videos you watch, subscribe, because there's new ones coming out every week, all next year. Here's to 2022. May it not immediately kill us all. That would be lovely.